uh, a good friend and brilliant uh, man, genius, as we say, uh, who is the visionary behind the Bay Lights, as you can see for the next two years on the Bay Bridge. Um, we're also very happy to be collaborating with them for a sound festival in 2014, so we're excited to be doing that. Uh, Soundwave is an innovative art and music festival. Uh, it's a two-year project every season, uh, and this is our sixth season, and we're talking about water this year. So we're very excited to have Ben Davis here to talk about uh, what it means to be uh, to do with Bay Lights and to uh, what he has planned next. So without further ado, Mr. Ben Davis. Thank you, California County of Sciences and BDA. And, uh, and if anyone has not yet participated in the sound wave, make a note, please. It's a great new event here in San Francisco. So we have about a half hour ago. And sit back and relax, and I'm just going to mostly tell you a story. Uh, it is a story not just of the Bay Lights, but it's actually a story about what is before and beyond the Bay Lights. You know, the story of gestation is pretty simple. On September 18th, as I was sitting at the ferry building, looking at this rich, beautiful West Bend, uh, you know, the idea dawned on me for the Bay Lights, and then just two and a half years later, on March 5th, the Bay Lights went live. Now, was anyone here for that event? All right. Badge of honor, because everyone knows that, that the skies opened up hard that night, the seas were splashing, it was a really crazy moment, but it sort of... Those folks who actually made it out there really do know that it was a spectacular time. But what I really want to do, since you know, there's a documentary on the Bay Lights that you'll be able to watch at some point, that tells you tells you this story. Uh, I want to tell you the story that I'm most qualified to tell you. So is that for me? Hi. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about what was happening before the moment of conception. You know, that's really interesting. Gestation is pretty mechanical in some ways, and birth is what birth is, but, but that magic of conception, that moment when things just come together, is really interesting. And I want to take you on a little story of this project, about the DNA of the project, which is really what was happening with me uh, at that time. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer in sort of nurse focus. If you want to understand what might happen in the future, you really need to look the other direction and study the past. If you want to figure out how to do things that, that can change the world a little bit, you need to start by really looking within yourself. And, and so let me just talk a little bit about me. I grew up in Boston in a really scruffy neighborhood where fight or flight was a really logical reaction to the pretty violent, racist environment in which I grew up. I was one of the lucky kids, a uh, good family, I was able to pretty much escape to California. Went to Cal Berkeley and all the things you sort of do as you grow up. I got married, got married, got married um, uh, had an 18 year marriage and relationship. A couple of those were actually good years. And, uh, and who knows by that laughter what I'm talking about. Um, and in 2003, I found myself out of that marriage. Um, and really, like, we often find ourselves like, pretty broken, you know, pretty devastating. It confused emotionally. Um, and I had about seven years where I you know, took great pleasure in being a single straight guy in the city of San Francisco, uh, which is not a hard thing to do, but you know, I was, I was the, the kind of guy that a lot of women here have encountered before. Great date, you know, make your breakfast in bed, but not really available in the deeper emotional levels. And in seven years passed, and, and I'm sort of, you know, was just wrapped in my protect, protective cocoon, and I started dating a woman who had been in a fire about a year earlier. And she had these marble scars on her body still, and, and there was something about the tenderness and intimacy of, of being gentle with that, that that made me start to feel tender, like I wanted to be worth, worthy again, worthy of receiving love, worthy of giving love, but I let myself fall in love. 
And it was pretty amazing six months, really a journey for me to open up uh, again and beyond where I hadn't even allowed myself to open up before. And then something really amazing happened. I got dumped on my ass. <laughs> that was interesting. That happened two days before Burning Man. Who knows of Burning Man? So now we're back in California and in San Francisco. Um, so when you're ripped raw open, the idea of going out to the desert and letting all that dust blow in <laughs> is a daunting, daunting prospect. But <laughs> this person, why don't we sit closer? Is that the girl from the fire? <laughs> so, so, but I, I just decided to go for it. I decided, you know what, what better place to be on you? Something magic was happening. I was cracked open. Ugly stuff was flowing up. Beautiful stuff was flowing in. And it felt better to be cracked or shut closed. I wanted to find a way to stay open. At the same time, something else was actually happening in my life. I have a good friend named Chip Connery. Anyone know Chip? So Chip Gray, Chip at the time was writing a book called Emotional Equations, where he was really working to break their emotions down and find all this mathematical essence. And we had dinners together and we were taking runs talking about that concept. And it hit me that my entire life, almost every reaction I've been having was coming from either one or two places. It was either coming from love or coming from fear, and almost all of it unconsciously was coming from a place of fear. Almost every decision I was making, the decisions that typically the designer to protect me and hurt other people. The designer hurt other people, they did hurt other people. And I realized they were sort of they were holding me back. And I was going to do my best to hang on to any consciousness I could find in any given moment, on any decision, large or small, when I realized maybe be conscious and try to make that decision from a place of love, including all the vulnerability that comes when you make a decision from a place of love. Put others' interest in front of yourself, take the risk associated with it. So, Love or fear, the binary system was in my head. So when I found myself sitting here, looking at this bridge, I had gone to Burning Man. It was a really amazing, wonderful experience as it often is out there in the fly in the desert. Um, and I, I was enthralled out the city of 50,000 people had come together in a week. No trash cans, no stop signs, almost no police. Beautiful shared experience of art, culture, and generosity, no money in your pocket, mostly bicycles, just this utopian feeling place. And then on Saturday, we watched it burn up and watch it be disassembled before people got back to the tar road, engaged in road rage. Like it just went away. All this crazy, beautiful human energy exported to the desert, burnt up, and then people come back to this world. And I thought, well, that, you know what? That's just something better could happen. Can take this energy and bring it back to where people live and let it live a little longer. I think all those thoughts were going on in my head when I saw this bridge that I had been working on from a professional perspective um, and thinking about its 75th anniversary, thinking about how it had opened six months before the Golden Gate Bridge was, was widely celebrated, and this beautiful, perfect, symmetrical system to the north opened up, and all the attention shifted in that direction, and this one fell into its hard work, hard working Cinderella role. When it hit me, it could just be not just a bridge, but, but a beautiful canvas of light. And I sat there and I looked at it, and I could kind of see it. It was beautiful. And I said, nah, that's a crazy idea. Just about to walk away from the idea when that consciousness, that flicker of consciousness, love and fear came. I said, oh, wait a second. That's, I'm feeling the fear, right? It's not that the idea is crazy. It's that I'm afraid of being judged crazy about the idea. The idea is beautiful. So what's the love and reaction? What's the love and reaction? What is the fearful reaction is to walk away. The love and reaction is to walk forward with the idea into the world, not worry about myself, not worry about being judged crazy, but just to, to, to get behind and bring out to the world really an idea that's back with love. You guys know some of the rest of the story. Um, I'll get to that in a second. I, I, my first call wasn't to the artist, it wasn't uh, the funders, it was to Caltrans actually, who had a relationship with. And, and I began telling them, talking to them, for my many years as being a volunteer community mediator in their areas of interest, they sort of live in this cooperation, this, this relationship with the Golden Gate Bridge, which typically overshadows them. I said, this is a chance for your 
years of work at retrofitting this beautiful bridge, the chance, this bridge to take care of and maintain, the chance for that bridge to shine, for briefly outshine its sister even to the north. And they started to get behind the idea. I was able to, um, almost by magic, meet, uh, come into contact with Leo Villarreal, who I think is the perfect artist at the perfect time to do this project, an amazing artist and human being. And we, we clicked and we, we talked deeply about this project, conceptually what it means, uh, what it means to do the city, the elegance, the white lighting scheme, the diamond anniversary that this man presented, uh, living in harmony with the new East Bay that would soon be opening up. Um, and then here in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, Bay Area, I was trying to figure out how to inspire people to get behind this project. And I decided we would think about high points. You know, and people may be familiar with the um, the Eiffel Tower, some folks who may have seen this, so I tried to think about reducing it to its iconic status. Thought about our bridge in its iconic status, it's the, it's the shape of the West Bend, and tried to just inspire us with sheer scale. I found out something really beautiful. We're eight times the size. Oh, it's a really beautiful moment. That, that hit me, like the shape of it, everything. that's actually to scale. That's amazing. Good job. So we were, you know, getting traction. I was kind of wiggling my fingers in the air. We were going through the ranks of the permitting process. Um, and, then, and then something really of magic happened again. Artist Leo Villarreal came up with this one minute long rendering, this visualization of our conversations that just changed everything. When you look at this rendering, um, you'll see that this looks a whole lot like what you see in the bridge now. This work has come through, it's lived through the sort of work of permitting and everything else with 100% artistic integrity. Um, it's really beautiful. Let me, you know, for those who don't know, it's 25,000 uh, individually controllable, energy efficient, white only LEDs on the west end of the Bay Bridge, facing mostly north. Uh, and two and a half years later, on March 5th, Beyond. This is what we're, oh wait, wait, first we have to have some CAD for you. Let's talk about the, uh, this is uh, developed by Parsons Breaker Hunt, but this really does show you how the technical challenge of it. I'm not the guy to give the best technical presentation, but you sort of get the picture that it's one thing to envision lights on a bridge, it's another thing to actually design a system that's safe. I can put them up there 500 feet in the air. Uh, in the uh, salty, you know, foggy, rainy, constantly vibrating space of the Bay Bridge. It was a heroic effort of a team that would go up every night between 11 a.m. and 5, between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. in the worst of conditions. And um, night upon night, over six months, install this work. And that brings us to. Uh, so this piece of video, which I stole off of a uh, video, which, which is just really a beautiful image stabilization camera. But this is the actual work. Let's get our good music back. <laughs> How are we doing on time? Is there a timekeeper here? Me. Yeah, how, are you, how are we doing so far? Yeah, 15 minutes. 15 minutes is great. We're doing great. So that's, that's the thing I like to you guys. And I'm going to try and leave enough time that we have some time for questions and answers on this project. Let me just say this has been an incredibly transformative project for me to work on. I think it's transformed our city. It's transformed what we feel about ourselves. It's certainly transformed the economics of the waterfront. Um, but it was also in addition to changing my own brain chemistry along the way, it really opened up a new level of possibility within our city and beyond of how people were thinking about public art and larger projects. We talked about a couple of projects that we're pursuing right now in San Francisco. Um, one of them has to do with Pier 14. Uh, Pier 14 is this long breakwater that sticks out, 637 feet out of the San Francisco Bay. It's the perfect going for the for the Bay Lights, and it's the only pier in San Francisco that I know that has a gate that closes at night. Just a little frustrating. So, in, uh, in looking at that, thinking, knowing that I was going to talk to the court about getting that gate open, I realized at nighttime it's, it's almost pitch black. And it's also really a 
home space. I mean, this is the challenge of San Francisco. But the social furniture they have out there are these individual stainless steel fishing chairs set about 30 yards apart that are, uh, are not really part of that social experience. And I've heard Leo Villarreal describe the Bay Lights as a digital campfire. I always love that description. And I wanted to think of a place where you can sit together like we, like we do with campfires and share the stories and songs that we, that we, uh, that we do when we feel connected by light that way. So I asked architect and artist Chris Foss to think about creating a sense of invitation from the Embarcadero. He came up with a beautiful lighting scheme that clads the gate and not only does that, but actually extends beneath the pier and creates gentle lighting all 637 feet out in the middle of San Francisco Bay. Just this really beautiful, gentle provocation that says, come, come out, it's safe. And then I worked with the folks at Rebar who were the responsible parking day, just really local gems here in San Francisco, asked them to rethink the social furniture. They came up with a concept for a communal seating area, uh, seating area at the end of the pier, the 30 foot bowl at the end of it. But the bit of magic they have is that's a heated seating area. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly how I felt. So, what a beautiful, open hearted gesture for our city to make to people who live here and people who are going to visit. You know, to sit out at night with uh, 30 other people and just be warm and be together and be under these flickering lights uh, is really a bit of magic. Makes me happy to think about. Another project that we're working on, I'm, I'm always, you know, like a lot of people in the city, focused on Market Street, our preeminent thoroughfare, our Champs Elysees, with all the potential it holds and all the frustration that it holds for all of us as we see it, not quite reaching its potential. Um, this is a project that a couple of young artists came to approach me with called the Light Rail, where we let it just play. It's one minute long. The other thing was that while we were putting the, this 
universal truth to love the borders and languages and religious affiliations and even sports affiliations. Some moment when everyone had one thing they could agree on, pies, you know, this irrational number, but it's, a, it's considered universal truth. Well, they didn't get the sequence right. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so the great cosmic joke is no one noticed. You flew over to NASA and Berkeley and different more labs and financial districts and Google, Facebook and the pantheon of mathematics. Uh, but I did. And, uh, and we agreed, uh, instead of to fight about it, they had so much fun doing it, and also never saw this sort of social media success, that we're going to just do it three more times. This time in sequence, there's 314 characters. Later this year, or maybe in the early next year, we're going to do it over Manhattan. We're going to do it over Los Angeles. And uh, thank you. Pi's been launched into a satellite that's now circling the Earth. There's a Pi Gazer app that will be free to download that will let you find Pi wherever it exists at the moment, above your head or below your feet. Uh, you see its ongoing, ever, ever developing arc uh, as a mass of Earth every 90, but it's traveling over 500,000 kilometers a day. And uh, you can even step back to the Earth and see how it's wrapped the Earth like a ball of string. So we're really playing with the concept of scale in a pretty strange way. Um, how are we doing our time now? About six minutes. Six minutes. So, so here's the big what's next for me. One of the um, fun things I get to do uh, is I get to be sort of tour guide, tour guide and, and gatekeeper for access to go to the top of the Bay Bridge on a cable walk. Um, and I've really been using that as a way to meet interesting people and develop important relationships as I work to bring other interesting projects to bear. Uh, that's Leo the Arialba Center, uh, and off to him with the beard is, is Sergey Brin of Google. Um, really fun to be up there with him. But just after this walk, uh, I went down to uh, the Google headquarters on, uh, on the Embarcadero there, and Leo gave a tech, tech talk on, on the Bay Lights. And afterwards, a woman stood up and said, she was Korean born American, no accent. And she said, you know, I live right across the street from one of the towers, and I look at the Bay Lights every single night and spend time there every night. And about three or four nights a week, I actually walked down to the Embarcadero and spent time even closer with it. And I find that if I'm in conflict with someone, whether that person is with me or not, I just can't stay angry when I look at that, those patterns, those algorithms, with this artwork. And I'm wondering if you've ever thought about putting it someplace where it can make a difference, a neighbor or a community. And, and the world just stopped for me for a second. And, and instantaneously, I saw the wall between Israel and Palestine with these algorithms on it, equally reflected on both sides, so that you can acknowledge that divide, but wow. in a sense, eliminate it, because everyone has to see the same thing, there's a sense of shared perspective. And it could be funded where each side gifts the other side's experience. And the name of the project would be Common Light. And when I came to, just a few seconds later, really, she was still finishing her question, and I was already starting to sweat through my shirt. And, and this is the project, which is now my guiding light, which I'll be working on over the next few years. It's the, it's the project my organization, Eliminate the Arts, as we're producing these other works of art, we'll have our eye on all the time. This is, this is when art starts to move into another space of having really pure and important meaning. In the world, I feel really great sense of gratitude to have a chance to work on it. To have the experience of the Bay Lights behind me and the support of groups like you as we figure out how to go forward and really do something transformative with our. Thank you very much.